Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here to talk to you today. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I need to tell you right up front that I'm uh, coming from a different place. And that doesn't mean just 8,000 miles east of here where we speak the Queen's English. I, uh, I'm actually coming from outside of the cleaning industry. But I hope that what I have to tell you today you know, will be of interest and will spark some dialogue with you because I am um, a microbiologist and I have been really interested in this field of um, infection risks and hygiene practices in the indoor environment and I've been looking at this for over 25 years now. As Jim mentioned, specifically I've been looking at the home environment and community settings being um, schools and daycare and residential care settings for elderly people. And out of this interest, um, in the last four years, as Jim mentioned, I was able to um, get going this center for, the Simmons Center for Hygiene and Health in Home and Community Settings, which we think is probably the first in North America, we claim it's the first in North America, that's looking at these issues um, all under one umbrella in an academic setting. And just so you know the kind of things that we have been doing there, we do a combination of research and um, education. So some of the research things that we've done already in our four years is we've, um, we've looked at infant formula preparation, how um, women prepare infant formula in the home because uh, nobody actually instructs anybody as to how to do that anymore and we were interested to see what's going on. We've looked at different mopping practices and how effective they are at reducing cross-contamination of bacterial pathogens. And I'll be speaking a little bit more about that tomorrow. Um, we've looked at the bacteria in the home, and specifically, we've been looking for the um, antibiotic-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, in home and community settings. We found it in about 27% of homes, just at environmental surfaces in the home. And you might be interested to know that the only correlating factor that we found for the presence of MRSA in the home was not are there young children in the home, was not do the occupants of the home work in healthcare. The only correlating factor statistically significant that we found was the presence of a cat. So if you have a cat in your home, you're more likely to have MRSA on environmental surfaces in your home. So that was absolutely interesting, fascinating, it doesn't mean we have to go home and microwave the cat, by the way. It's just, yeah. we, think, we think the cats are surrogate carriers. You know, we as humans shed the bacteria in the home. The cats pick them up on their paws and carry them on their soft tissue and then shed them back into the environment. We've been looking now for MRSA in wrestling, um, on wrestling mats and in athletic arenas because everybody knows there's been a problem. Uh, around various sports teams. So yes, we do find it on wrestling mats and we find it on yoga mats and services where there is uh, full body contact, you know, and that don't get cleaned on a very regular basis. And nobody seems to quite know who's responsible for the cleaning of those kind of surfaces. We did a study on hand washing on college campuses. <clears throat> that was very revealing, looking at the hand washing practices of undergraduate students. And um, the fascinating thing is that residential facilities on college campuses are considered to be private facilities, at least in the state of Massachusetts. So as a result, the college authorities are not required to provide soap and towels or paper towels or any means of hand drying in the residential bathrooms. So guess what? The students don't wash their hands. You know, not a big surprise. But you know, until you actually go out and ask these questions and sort of put two and two together and get these answers. Um, we've just completed a, a study on prepackaged, pre-washed spinach. You know, there was a lot of concern last year about E. coli 157 in spinach. And we got wondering about, there are all sort of claims made about a spinach is double washed, it's triple washed. Uh, you don't need to wash it as a consumer. We really wanted to check that out. And we found that even on <clears throat> uh, packaged spinach that's triple washed, uh, we're starting with counts of bacteria of 10 million to 100 million um, per milliliter of wash fluid. 
just when you open the bag. So, you know, despite the wash claims, there are, there are very high levels of bacteria. So the moral there is please wash your spinach before you eat it. And uh, now we are trying to set up a study in Lima, Peru, to look at the influence, just as Dr. Cole mentioned in his South African study, what's happening in the homes of people who are very poor and who have very poor facilities, very little information and education. What is the influence of contaminated food and a contaminated environment on diarrheal illness rates in the children? Because the world has spent billions of dollars improving drinking water quality, quite rightly, for people around the world. But despite the improvements in water quality, still seeing very high levels of diarrheal illness. So we want to go and see, well, if it's not the water, is it the food that the children are being fed when they're weaned at age six months? So that's just a background of some of the things that we, we're doing at our center. Despite the fact that most of my work is, is really informed from, from the home, uh, I think that uh, we're really looking at a continuum. We're looking, if you imagine a line, um, think of the home at one end, think of community settings perhaps in the middle, think of commercial settings at the other end. We're dealing with um, the same sort of pathogens. We're dealing with the same kind of inanimate surfaces. The difference is we're dealing with very different populations of occupants, and we're dealing with very different um, levels of scale. You know, the difference between a home with two or three or five individuals and a building, a commercial building with thousands. So I do see it as a continuum, and I think that we, you know, each of these environments can inform um, the other. So um, the aims of my presentation, I hope by the time I finish, that you'll be able to take away some of these things with you that you will understand that there is a microbial uh, infection risk in the indoor environment. I'm sure you actually know that already. I don't need to tell you that. But that in terms of infection risk, the indoor environment is it's very complex and it's very dynamic. It's changing all the time. And my science is a very incomplete science. We really know so very little about the indoor environment. In fact, I met Chuck Gerber here this morning. Are you still here, Chuck? Yeah, he's over there. Dr. Gerber from the University of Arizona, he's always telling us that we know more about the microbiology of the moon than we do of the indoor environment. Um, I want to talk to you about a, um, an approach called targeted hygiene. Um, we've heard target already, but an approach that I sort of really developed for my, uh, in my PhD research and that's been taken up by um, several organizations around the world as a way to sort of try and logically deal with some of the problems that I'm going to talk to you about. I'm hoping that um, I can use this as an introduction to, to you and to be able to develop a dialogue with you. I would really like input as to how I can take this thinking uh, further. And I really hope that you understand it is a work in progress. It's really developing. And I also want to just get myself out of trouble. I really dislike it when the previous speakers say the subsequent speakers are going to be talking about this and this and this. And I'm not really talking about hospitals. And I'm not really talking about the hygiene hypothesis or other things that people might have said I'm talking about. But I'd be very happy to take questions in the question session. So, and I'll try not to put onto Marilyn Black anything that I'm not going to talk about for later this afternoon. So let's talk about the health risks um, and microbial contaminants in the indoor environment. There is a growing awareness of the risks of coming into contact with microbes in the indoor environment. And in particular, contact with uh, contaminated surfaces, hard surfaces and fabrics. And that's really what I'm talking about, surfaces that we can clean. And the risks really range, uh, for in, you know, in terms of this kind of contact, uh, this contact. You can come into direct contact with your hands and put something directly to your mouth. Uh, you can breathe in aerosolized pathogens. 
Um, you can, I don't quite know what I put, when I wrote this a month ago, water immersion, I don't think I was talking about baptism, but I think I was talking about the risks of uh, when surfaces, as have been mentioned already, particularly soft fabrics become wet, when there's been flooding, when there's been backflow of sewage, those kind of pathogens that then get into our environment. And um, another risk that's been mentioned already is the uh, allergic reactions that we can have to many of these microbial uh, allergens in the environment. These kind of risks are the same really for all kind of building types. Doesn't really matter if it's an old building or a new building. Doesn't really matter if it's a commercial building or a building for domestic use. All buildings um, can favor microbial pathogens if they're not uh, well maintained and if they're not uh, well cleaned. And just very interesting to note that some 70 million Americans are actually now working in an office. And this is one of the societal changes. We talk about the societal changes that are making, putting us more at risk for infection. Because, you know, back in the 1960s, the then uh, Surgeon General announced to Congress that we could close the book on infectious disease. We didn't have to worry anymore. We were in the age of antibiotics. We understood how to treat infectious disease. And that clearly was a very, very wrong, um, short-sighted statement because the risks from infectious disease have, in fact, been growing. We are recognizing more pathogens. In the last 30 years, we've recognized about 30 new pathogens. So uh, it is an ongoing problem. And some of the societal drivers that are putting us more at risk are things like people are all all over the world are, mu are moving from rural situations into urban situations. So they're living in much closer quarters, closer together. And then I thought about this when you think about the number of people who were working indoors in offices. You know, traditional work was to be outdoors and on the farm. And now we're all crowding into relatively small indoor environments and sharing these pathogens and uh, sharing these pathogens with our environment and with each other. We've already heard this morning um, from Dr. Cole the concerns about uh, immunocompromised uh, populations. And I just want to reiterate again that some 25% of the American population is um, considered to be at higher risk for infectious disease. This is another driver. This is another driver that is increasing our concern about infectious disease. And the people in this population who are at higher risk for infectious disease are, as we've already heard, children and infants under the age of five, elders over the age of 65, pregnant women, people who are living in resident care facilities, people who are living at home but are being treated, um, and Another interesting thing that happened, another driver, societal driver, that happened in about the middle of the 20th century was that we started taking these high-risk populations and we started grouping them together. So let's take all the little kids who are under five, who are at high risk, and let's put them in daycare where they can really share their, you know, really share their pathogens together. And, and that's what we do. 75% of under five-year-olds in the USA are now in daycare. And we do the same thing with elders. We take them out of their individual homes and we put them together in daycare settings and residential settings for elders. People who are in the public health field talk about um, daycare settings for children as being the cesspits of society. They really are, uh, you know, the place where you really find really huge numbers of especially respiratory and enteric pathogens that the that children are sharing in those settings. But we have to keep this in perspective as well. Um, you know, we have to go out and live our lives every day and not be terrified about the environment that we live in. And just because you find a pathogenic organism 
in an indoor environment doesn't immediately put you at risk. So there are a number of criteria that have to be present in order for this res risk to really manifest itself uh, in disease. And uh, this is a diagram that was taken from um, a chapter I wrote for, for Seymour Block's big book. And um, just to take you through it, there are uh, at least four different things that have to be present in the indoor environment for us to be uh, really concerned. Um, so in an indoor environment, the criteria for there to be a real risk from infection are, firstly, you need to have the pathogenic organisms present, bacteria, fungi, viruses, or other parasites. You need a source or reservoir, uh, as Dr. Cole has already mentioned. That might be people who are infected or who are carrying um, animals and uh, wild animals or pets, pests and pets that are infected or carrying uh, food can be a source of many of these uh, pathogens. Um, and then surfaces, inanimate surfaces, can act as reservoirs and sources, as I'll uh, show you later. Um, inanimate objects in the environment and equipment, such as equipment in, for example, a um, gymnasium, um, the mats and the uh, exercise equipment can all be sources. So, okay, you've got those two, but then you still need a way to, for, that, um, for those pathogens to be transmitted from that surface to uh, the human occupants. So the transmission is usually via direct contact, often via hands, or via indirect contact, uh, something else is involved, or from hands to food and food to mouth. And that transmission is usually, but not always, to individuals who are considered to be of higher risk. So this, the immunocompromised population that we've already talked about. Um, healthy uh, adults are at lower risk, not to say that they're at no risk at all, but generally tend to be at lower risk for this kind of um, transmission. So a number of people have already gone over the cleaning terminology, and, but just to be um, clear, I want to go over a couple of terms that I'm going to use. And I also want to make it clear right at the start that the kind of microbial contamination that we're talking about on surfaces, you can't see it. And surfaces can look beautifully clean and still be contaminated uh, with pathogens. So visually clean surfaces can still be contaminated. And I actually remember being in a home one time, sampling uh, in somebody's home, and it was one of those kitchens that I always sort of dreamed to aspire to. It was so sparkling and beautiful, and clearly the household had done something to, to do before I got there. But I was amazed at the level of fecal contamination that was on in and around her kitchen sink. In fact, the levels were so high that I did something I don't usually do, which is to go back and say, you know, kind of what was going on in your home. So it turns out that um, when her baby needs her diaper changed, when he has a soiled diaper, she bathes him in the kitchen sink. So uh, I couldn't, you know, I would never have known that. You couldn't have seen that by looking. But by doing microbial analysis, we found very heavy levels of fecal pathogens in the kitchen sink. So I don't think I'll go over the definitions of cleaning again because we've already talked about that. Disinfection I would like to talk about. We have talked about it some already, but I'd just like to reiterate. It's a process that um, eliminates nearly all the recognized pathogenic microorganisms, but not all of them. It isn't a process that could sterilize a surface. It's a process that le uh, reduces pathogens to levels that are considered to be not harmful to health. And um, it kills the vegetative forms or removes or kills the vegetative forms that are relatively easy to kill, but often leaves behind the spores such as um, Dr. Cole was talking about the extreme example of anthrax spores that are uh, much more difficult to inactivate. 
Usually, people think of disinfection in terms of a chemical or a thermal treatment, but I also will come back to that uh, on, on the next slide. Sanitation is a similar term. It implies reduction of microbial levels of pathogens to, so that the surfaces are safe from a public health standpoint. Sanitation tends to be used more around the food uh, industry. It's a term that really comes from that industry. But they're, they're really relatively sim similar, these two terms. Antisepsis always refers to the uh, destruction or inhibition of microbes on the skin. And that's not necessarily something that uh, we're talking about uh, today. And then comes this new term, hygienic cleaning. And this was a term that was formulated by the um, International Forum on, on Home Hygiene, the group that I work with in Europe, that describes a practice that removes the soil or the organic material as well as removes the microorganisms um, from an inanimate surface. So it's a, like a, traditionally cleaning and disinfection has been a two-step process, but this is a combination of the two steps in one. So how do we achieve disinfection on inanimate surfaces? And as I said, I want to just make very clear that disinfection does not necessarily equal the use of chemicals. It is possible to achieve disinfection uh, by heat, Remembering that the definition of disinfection is to reduce the levels of microbes on a surface so that they are, um, so that rendering that surface safe. So you can do that by heat. You can do it by the use of soap and detergents, especially if you're talking about surfaces that can be rinsed. You can do it by mechanical action, actually physically, mechanically, uh, removing uh, microbes from surfaces. Drying is also a very important um, means of, re of disinfection. And oftentimes, it's actually a combination of all of these that we're using. And you only have to think of the example of actually, if you wash your hands, you're using heat, hot water, you're using soap, you're using mechanical action as you're actually rubbing and removing uh, microbes from the surfaces. You use drying, it's a very important component, component of hand washing. So, and I think that same analogy applies to many of the processes that are used in, in cleaning. It's a combination of all these processes. <clears throat> so, it, it quickly becomes obvious once you start diving into this uh, topic, and uh, somebody asked the question at the end of Dr. Cole's presentation, which I kind of was a nice segue, segue, which was, well, you know, I want the operating theater to be clean, but does my hotel room have to be clean? And, you know, it becomes a very complex subject trying to determine what factors are involved and trying to determine where you should really be focusing attention in terms of hygienic cleaning, reducing the levels of microbes in an environment. So some of the things to do, consider uh, are, you know, which surfaces should we routinely be disinfecting? Which surfaces are we really concerned about in terms of reducing the levels of microbes on, on, on the surface? Which surfaces might we not routinely disinfect, but we would want to disinfect if we knew there was an outbreak of an infection? You know, is that a different subgroup of all surfaces? Are there surfaces that we wouldn't routinely get to, but hey, there's an outbreak, now let's consider those surfaces as well. What kind of procedures would be most effective uh, at the surfaces that we're talking about? How do we maximize the benefits of disinfection? When should we disinfect? How often should we disinfect? Studies that have been done um, indicate that uh, when you do achieve disinfection on a surface, when you reduce the levels of microbes on the surface, they quickly, will quickly reestablish themselves once the surfaces are used again. 
So, you know, do we do this many times a day, once a day, once a week, once a month? You know, what would be a logical way to approach this situation? Then there are some surfaces that are much more difficult to achieve disinfection, particularly the, the soft fabrics, um, the carpets, the porous surfaces. So how do we deal with those if we need to disinfect them? What kind of contaminants are we talking about? Do we know uh, what the likely contaminants that these surfaces are going to be? And how do we deal with them? What about the occupants in our building? that we're talking about. Are they people who are mostly healthy adults or are they people who are considered at higher risk for infection? How do we maximize on disinfection practices? How do we maximize on, on reducing the levels of microbes and at the same time minimize the risks of toxicity and minimize the risks uh, to the environment? that are associated with many chemicals. So we want you know, a big result in terms of killing or removing microbes, but we want the minimum risk from the chemicals, as has already been indicated this morning. And how do we achieve disinfection? Again, going back to things like soft surfaces um, and uh, electronic equipment, how do we achieve disinfection at these kind of surfaces without damaging uh, the materials? I've noticed that the people who come to clean my office, they obviously have been instructed never to touch the keyboard in my office. And yet, as I'll show you, I think surfaces where, we, where there's hand contact, very high risk for transmission of infection. So there's a whole issue there as to how we go about dealing with that. And really, if you think of these complexities, it becomes clear that each type of uh, indoor environment requires a cleaning and disinfection plan that really takes into account all of the factors that I've already mentioned. So let's take the example, for example, of non-porous floors, hard floors, in three different settings. Oh, very important, I forgot to mention, a very important factor, dealing with the unexpected or the unknown. You know, if you're in a home, you're kind of pretty, you're pretty much in charge, you know what's going on. If you're responsible for a large building with thousands of people, there's always the possibility that there's going to be someone coming in who suddenly has become infected or is a carrier, and you don't know that they're there. I'll come back to that. So let's take the example of these three settings, of a, of a floor in a daycare setting, a residential setting for the elderly, and an office. In a daycare, uh, there are infants, so there's your high-risk population. Um, they provide a constant source, source of respiratory and fecal pathogens, and um, they're in direct contact with the floor. You know, they're crawling around it and licking it and playing on it all the time. Uh, in a residential setting for elders, you have your elderly uh, immunocompromised population, they're at risk. They are pathogens. We know that there are pathogens that are shared into uh, elder care settings. Many of people are being moved from hospital into elder care, and they're bringing many hospital pathogens with them into those kind of settings. And also, while they don't usually play on the floor, they're vulnerable to falls. So they do fall and make contact with the floor, and there is literature to indicate that elders have become infected from that contact with the floor. And then think about an office. Usually very little contact with the floor, usually a population of healthy adults. And so if you look, about, look at that same surface in three different settings with three different populations, you would come to the conclusion that the daycare and the residential floor needs cleaning and disinfecting on a very uh, regular basis, at least daily. It would be difficult to justify a disinfection process on the office floor. Not to say it shouldn't be cleaned, but it would be difficult to justify, I would suggest, that you would need to disinfect the office floor unless something particularly untoward 
um, was to happen. Uh, just to backtrack a little bit, and we've mentioned some of this already, but the sources of these pathogens into the environment are constant. Uh, perhaps um, the main sources are humans. We ourselves, we are covered in microbes um, on our external surfaces and all the mucosal tracts of our internal surfaces. We're covered with microbes. The vast majority of them are uh, beneficial or at least do us no harm. But we also carry pathogens. Um, and can excrete pathogens after illness. Same for pets and pests. Raw foods, um, all raw meats, um, and even raw, produ raw produce and salads are a source of pathogens into the indoor environment. And we are advised to assume that all raw poultry, for example, is likely to be contaminated with salmonella and campylobacter, and we should treat it accordingly. Now, if the food is cooked thoroughly, um, that should not present a problem, but uh, in preparation, you leave these pathogens behind on contact surfaces, on food counters, on cutting boards, on people's hands, and then people's hands go to other hand contact surfaces, handles and taps and things. So these pathogens get spread around. Air, um, airborne fungi, as Dr. Cole has already mentioned, is a problem in the indoor environment. And then classically, people think about um, diseases such as Legionella, bacterial diseases such as Legionella, that are coming from water systems and are being moved around the indoor environment in the air. So Legionella has also been associated with actually poorly maintained shower heads in, um, in for example, in hotels. Legionella has been um, collected from the water coming out of shower heads in hotels. And fungi, as Dr. Cole has already mentioned, are particularly um, associated with damp and very poorly ventilated uh, indoor environments. Water, while in the USA we're, we're pretty lucky, we have a you know, pretty good supply of drinking water. You can, most, place, most parts of the country you can safely drink what's um, coming out of the tap. Um, water damage to buildings does bring pathogens into the building. So flooding and sewage backflow are sources of pathogens into the building. And now, um, studies on things like jacuzzis and hot tubs inside of buildings are indicating that they also can bring a source of, um, of respiratory pathogens, the mycobacteria, into the indoor environment. So every time we kind of, it seems like in the indoor environment, every time we have a great new idea or we tweak it a little bit, oh, let's bring the jacuzzi inside or, you know, the hot tub inside, then you have a whole new niche. You create a whole new niche for, back, for microbes and pathogens in your indoor environment that they will um, enjoy. <laughs> It's clear from a literature review and from the studies that I and others have been involved in that many areas of the general indoor environment can become contaminated. It's difficult to estimate the frequency with which um, specific surfaces can be uh, contaminated. And it's because the epidemiological studies really have not been done, it's really difficult to know uh, the frequency, frequency with which contaminated surfaces are either directly or indirectly responsible for infection. But there are some studies that really do very clearly link the risk of infection with contaminated indoor surfaces. So way back I proposed that we um, should classify uh, the surfaces in, in our indoor environment into these uh, four groupings that I want to talk about. And it's in these four groupings that the uh, risks of contamination and cross-contamination are at the highest. So the reservoirs, uh, in, and in this context, what I'm calling the reservoirs, and I, I know there, be conf there is some confusion because we call reservoirs different things depending on where we're coming from. But in this context, I call the reservoirs all the wet areas, such as the toilet bowl, the sinks, and the drains. Um, anything that's wet 
uh, favors the growth of bacteria. And so here you get high levels of bacterial growth. You get contamination, obviously, directly from humans to this environment. We are contaminating these environments. And you get high levels of enteric bacteria, the bacteria that come from our gut, uh, are found uh, at surfaces. And because they're moist, um, the bacteria thrive in these kind of wet environments. And you can sample these environments anywhere you go. You can sample them and find high levels of enteric bacteria in these kind of environments. Then I, uh, there are the, the group of surfaces that I call the reservoir disseminators. These are all the wet cleaning utensils, the sponges, the rags, the mops. They're reservoirs because they're wet. Um, they often have organic particles in them, so they really, you know, they pick up particles when they're cleaning. So they really favor the growth of microbes. So you get very high levels of contamination in these items. But at the same time, the, the, way, the very way that we use them, we actually can disseminate or transfer microbes from one surface to another. So you can pick up a sponge, and we've demonstrated this time and time again. You can pick up a, a sponge from the kitchen sink. You can use it to wipe down a counter, and you do the, the bacterial analysis, and you find more bacteria on the counter following using the sponge. Than, the, than were there previously, because you're just disseminating this stuff from the sponge to other surfaces. Then there are the uh, hand and food contact surfaces. So things like kitchen counters and cutting boards, um, electronic keyboards, phone handsets, athletic equipment that we're handling all the time. These surfaces tend to be drier, and because they're drier, they, uh, we, we tend to get lower levels of microbes and pathogens uh, at these sites. But despite the fact that we have lower levels, they, I would consider them at higher risk than maybe the other things I've mentioned because of the fact that we're in direct contact with these surfaces. So there's the potential for, cr for cross-contamination, picking up pathogens on the surfaces and moving them, them directly to your face. Your eyes and your mouth are two main gateways for pathogens to get into your body. So if you move these things from surfaces to your face, um, you can directly inoculate yourself. Or you can, we can move them from the surface to a foodstuff that maybe isn't going to be cooked. And then the bacteria will flourish in the food and grow and become a foodborne problem. Or by contact with mats, wrestling mats, um, mats in the gymnasium, and lesions on the skin, there's the potential to pick up these pathogens directly uh, into the skin. And that's what's been happening in the athletic arena around um, sports programs, particularly football and wrestling programs. Uh, the athletes have, you know, because of the nature of their sport, their skin gets abraded and damaged, and that's just a, an open doorway again for pathogens to get into their bodies. And then this, finally, this other group, the floors, the carpets, and the soft furnishings. Whilst we generally find a lower numbers of bacterial pathogens on dry surfaces, um, Dr. Cole has mentioned the very high levels of fungal pathogens that are found at these surfaces. We do know that bacterial and viral pathogens can be shed onto these surfaces and can survive for really um, quite extensive periods of time uh, on these surfaces. So again, another potential risk associated here, particularly when you think about the way that those floors might be used. So those are the four groups of sites I want to talk about. Now I just want to indicate some of the literature research that's uh, shown the kind of infections that have been associated with these surfaces. So um, our wet reservoirs, um, not surprising infections involving E. coli and other coliforms that are, that are gut pathogens, fecal pathogens, salmonella, shigella, dysentery, shigella soniae, dysentery, um, 
these pathogens hang around. Salmonella has been shown to survive under the rim of the toilet for many days. Um, Shigella um, is found when there's an outbreak of Shigella, dysentery especially associated with young children in, in schools. Um, the pathogen can be found around the toilets and it can be found around the basin and the taps. Uh, norovirus, the, the cruise ship virus, we all think of as the cruise ship virus and the projectile vomiting. Again, when there's an outbreak, that virus is found at around these kind of surfaces. Having said that, you might be surprised at my final bullet point there, which says that I would may still maintain the risk of cross-contamination from these surfaces back to humans is relatively low, except when there actually is an outbreak of, and for example, of, of enteric infection, diarrheal illness or vomiting illness. Most of the time, the risk of picking up pathogens in the bathroom uh, is relatively low. Now our reservoir uh, disseminator sites, and again, uh, these surfaces, the literature indicates you can find the coliforms, the salmonella, uh, listeria, MRSA, that's the methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Everyone is so concerned about this organism nationally. I'm sure you've heard about the major concerns. And there is, in general, a lot of concern about uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria. In fact, there are people in the, experts in the field who would say that we're actually now in a post-antibiotic era. There's so little work being done on producing new antibiotics, and the bacteria are way ahead of us in terms of their ability to evolve quickly and become resistant to the antibiotics that we already have. So a big concern. And fungal contaminants also are associated with poorly maintained um, wet cleaning utensils. So I would say there's always the risk. Because of the nature of use of these, um, these items, there's always a risk that pathogens are going to be cross-contaminated from one surface where maybe they don't really matter to another surface where we will have direct contact. And then um, hand and food contact surfaces. This is the list of pathogens that have been um, associated in the literature. You can find evidence for fecal coliforms, uh, cytomegalovirus, rotavirus in daycare settings, MRSA in the home, athletic and long-term care facilities for the elders, vancomycin resistant enterococci, which is a very hardy pathogen in, uh, in long-term care facility for the elders, rhinovirus and influenza virus. Dr. Gerber has done a lot of the work indicating these pathogens in office environments, especially on um, hand contact surfaces. Um, and again, because of the way that we are in direct contact with these kind of surfaces, I would say there's always the risk of cross-contamination, um, and particularly where there are groupings who are vulnerable, the immunocompromised individuals. The question is, what do we do about intermediate settings such as offices? You know, where you know you've got kids or you've got elderly people, there's definitely a known high risk. You would know that you would want to carry out a disinfection process at these surfaces. But what do you do in an office setting? We, re we really need so much more information. Am I saying that we should be practicing disinfection on the keyboards all the time? Am I saying that we should be practicing disinfection when we know there's an outbreak? Would we know that there's an outbreak? Would we know that there was an unknown individual who was infected? So that's really why I've left a question mark there. And you know, these are the areas I'd really appreciate your feedback. And, um, Things like how do you carry out disinfection of keyboards, as I've already mentioned. And then, you know, I go into, <clears throat> I have a kind of a skewed view of the world, I guess, as I, as I travel around, especially the indoor environment. So I went into a beautiful new art museum in Boston recently, and the first thing that caught my attention was this wonderful room that was full of computers and keyboards and kids. And I think, wow, that's great. They're really into technology. Uh, hold on a minute. You know, what about the infection risk? associated with the keyboards, and does anybody think about that, and is anybody responsible for that? And I don't know what the answer is to that question. And then you have the floors, um, carpets, and soft furnishings, um, the pathogens that have been associated 
um, Clostridium difficile spores, a, a, a hospital pathogen that you find very, very hardy, that you find uh, in long-term care facilities with elders. Um, streptococci, MRSA, enteric pathogens, same list, noroviruses, sorry, I, that, that's another way of expressing noroviruses, fungal contaminants, and also we know that we have the byproducts of the, of the microbes, the, the VOCs. The risk of infection here is really associated with people who are, as I already mentioned, who are um, at higher risk. The question I have is how do we clean and disinfect well, all kinds of floors effectively, but how do we clean and disinfect unusual floor surfaces? For example, the gym that I go to has an indoor turf in the gym. So, of course, being me, the first thing I ask is, how do you clean this turf indoors? Um, high use, young people there all the day using this, this turf, and the management of the facility didn't know. Oh, we have to go and ask the manufacturer of the turf. You know, and the guy, the manager of the facility, he actually said to me, it was very sweet, he said, well, I pick up this bottle of disinfectant something and I just kind of spray it randomly on the turf. And I said, well, I know for sure that that's not going to achieve anything, you know. So um, those kind of questions I have. Um, there has, there's quite a lot of uh, materials out there that are claimed to be antimicrobial antimicrobial uh, textiles and fabrics. Um, they are often impregnated with triclosan. And there's really a very big question mark over the use of triclosan uh, as an imp to impregnate those kind of materials. Firstly, um, is it effective? You know, can triclosan be effective if you impregnate it into, lock it into a fabric? Is it the right kind of chemical to be using? Is it broad spectrum? Does it kill the kind of microbes that you want it to kill? And um, what, is the tri you know, what is the risk to the environment? And there is a question mark over triclosan and its risk as it gets into the waterways of our environments. <clears throat> Dr. Cole mentioned um, we need to be lobbying to improve design for effective cleaning. We need to be communicating what we know about risks to the people who are designing. So we really need to be bringing these two communities together. Um, lobby for imp improving design of electronic equipment. And in my reading for coming here today, I noticed that um, there are new keyboards that are available, especially being developed for hospital use, that are flat keyboards, so, so they don't have the sort of individual keys, it's just a flat surface. So it's much easier to clean and disinfect without causing any damage. And I noticed that there was one keyboard that was developed for a hospital in London, which actually um, requires that it be wiped with an alcohol um, sanitizer. And if it doesn't detect the alcohol sanitizer at regular intervals between 3 and 12 hours, it flashes a light. The keyboard indicates to the user that, hey, you need to be wiping me. So that was a way, because of the concern about multiple use of keyboards in clinical settings when multiple um, healthcare personnel are coming along and using the keyboard and the risk of transmission, this was a way of alerting the users that they need to. It's a smart keyboard. Dr. Cole's already mentioned um, unusual indoor environments uh, such as aircraft, so I won't um, go back to that. So this thing, uh, how do we make sense of all this information? And this was the question, you know, is it the operating theater or is it the hotel room? How do we make sense of all of this? Uh, what do we clean? Uh, when do we clean? And when do we need to carry out a disinfection process? The traditional, well, there was, well, there was kind of two traditional approaches, one of which was to, to try and disinfect everything. And that was, um, you know, pretty wasteful. It was wasteful of time, wasteful of energy, wasteful of resources, um, excess use of chemicals, and it really wasn't very effective either. The, the other approach is to say, hey, the indoor environment, it doesn't matter, there's no risk, we won't disinfect anything. You know, those are the two sort of polar opposites. But I think um, I've asked myself these questions, and I think you can come up or begin to come up with a logical approach to knowing how to deal with all these different surfaces in all these different envir environments. 
So I came up with the following responses. The, the, um, the answer is setting specific. So as I indicated already, what you did to a, a, a floor in a daycare would be different to what you do to a floor in an office. You have to ask yourself, what's the probability of a significant, con significant contamination at the surface that I'm thinking about? What's the likelihood that that contamination can be transferred from that surface, surface to a higher risk site or to an individual? So, you know, um, we don't really have contact with the walls or the ceiling, or we don't have, really have contact with windows. You know, those are surfaces that you really wouldn't ever want to consider disinfecting except under very unusual situation. What's the vulnerability of the community that you're talking about? What's the chance that, that the risk would increase from the normal level to a higher level um, if there was an outbreak? What would we do then? And this final thing, what's the consideration for the unknown factors? You know, what's the likelihood of there being a carrier or a shedder, uh, an unrecognized, undiagnosed individual in this community who could be um, shedding pathogens into the environment? So I would say that a successful targeted hygiene program really requires a continuous assessment of these factors and it, it needs the ability to mount a flexible response. It's not, well, we're doing it this way because we always do it this way. You know, okay, we might need to do it differently if the circumstances change. And using this approach and asking yourself these questions, you can come up with uh, recommendations. And you can make recommendations about the kind of disinfection process and the frequency of disinfection process. You can make recommendations about choosing the appropriate disinfection process. Um, you know, the, are you using a process that's really targeting the microbes in your environment, the pathogens that you're concerned about? Um, are you using a process that's, that's um, time sensitive? You know, is it one of those processes that you have to leave for an, a, a significant period of time or is this a quick process? What's the level of organic soil? that you're talking about. Is the presence of organic soil going to interfere with trying to uh, carry out a disinfection process? And at the same time, always considering the need for um, economy, uh, low energy, and low toxicity. These seem to be the buzzwords. So here's my attempt. Does that read back there? Can you read there? Okay. You can read? Okay. So here is my attempt at trying to bring all this together into a logical um, situation. So here we have our reservoirs. Remember, these are the wet areas such as the toilet, toilet bowls, the sinks, the drains. Yes, there is a risk that there's going to be pathogenic contamination there because of the nature of the way that we use those uh, areas. What's the risk that the, that pathogen is going to be transferred? I would say it's intermediate to low um, on, a, on a normal basis, but it's going to increase if there was an outbreak of enteric infection. Um, what would be the hygienic cleaning recommendations uh, for, that, for these services? Well, you carry out a disinfection process for high-risk communities, um, and when you know there's an outbreak of infection, and also if you consider that this, the unknown risk is significant for you and for the, and for the community that you're dealing with. What would be the best approach? Um, it's, you know, the best approach here probably is not um, uh, a once a week disinfection process. Um, definitely at least a once a day if you're going to carry out disinfection. The ideal would be to have a constant release process. So for example, for the toilet, every time you flush, there's going to be some kind of disinfection. In fact, flushing itself, by the way, is a disinfection process. Flushing takes away most of the uh, contamination in the toilet, but there are also the possibility of adding on some sort of constant release chemical to that situation. The disseminators, your wet cleaning utensils, your sponges, your rags, your mops, risk of pathogenic contamination is high. The transfer risk is constant because of the way that they're used. 
um, what would be the recommendation for hygienic cleaning, that these items should be cleaned and disinfected both before and after use. And how would you do that? Well, you could use broad spectrum chemicals, you could use heat, or you could simply use disposables and just get rid of them. The food contact surfaces, the counters, and the hand contact surfaces, the, the, food, co the food counters, the handles, the uh, switches, everything that we touch, the keyboards, the phones, the athletic equi equipment, the risk of pathogenic contamination. Remember, these surfaces are dry, and there are, uh, we've, Studies have shown that you don't always find pathogens, so I would say that it's a variable risk here that you're going to find pathogens. What's the transfer risk? What's the possibility that these pathogens are going to move from this site to a higher risk? It's very high if following raw food and food preparation. It's intermediate to low for general hand contact, but it increases, especially when you know that there are outbreaks of respiratory or enteric infections in the communities, then the possibility of picking up pathogens from a surface on your hands is going to increase. Um, so what would be the recommendations here? Always following um, contact with raw foods, you would want to carry out a disinfection process. Um, you would, uh, my recommendation would be that you would want to disinfect hand contact surfaces for high-risk communities uh, all the time and when you know there's an infection outbreak in your community. How do you do that? Um, heat and detergent, um, mechanical uh, action, you can use broad spectrum chemicals, food safe uh, chemicals, alcohol wipes, and then there are some new technologies. There are microfiber cloths that, that are being developed, and there's um, ultraviolet wands even that I've heard about that you sort of hold above the surface, the ultraviolet radiation will destroy the microbes. <clears throat> and then for the floors and the soft furnishings and um, risk of pathogenic contaminants um, is intermediate to low. The risk of transfer, again, intermediate to low, depends on the population. De you know, if you've got those kids crawling around on the floors, that's going to be different. Uh, it increases when you know there are outbreaks of infection, enteric infection, and skin infections that can be um, picked up by direct contact with the floor. So how, what's the approach? You disinfect these surfaces for high-risk communities and when you know there's an infection outbreak. Again, broad-spectrum chemicals for non-porous surfaces, vacuuming, hot water extraction, and laundering are all processes that we can use at these kind of surfaces. So, a lot of information. So, in summary, I'd like to say that, um, yes, there is an infection risk associated with the indoor environment, and the indoor envir environment is very complex, and we really know not too much about it at this point in time. The risks are dynamic and changing, and they're situation dependent, as I've tried to indicate to you, depending on who the occupants are and that these risks can be reduced effective cleaning. And by using effective cleaning, and effective cleaning, it's much better to practice effective cleaning and prevent the risk of infection rather than having to treat um, an infection outbreak. Uh, this targeted hygiene approach you know, could be developed, provides a logical framework for thinking about all of the different uh, sites and surfaces that we have to deal with. Deal with. We do need to be um, concerned about our environments, so we need to um, always have an eye to ensuring that there is a, the right balance between what we're doing in the indoor environment and not actually adding to the risks in our environment. Uh, communication, absolutely vital. I think it's, you know, people who are, we all need to know this stuff. Whether you're in the industry, whether you're not in the industry, whatever kind of user of a building you are, you need to have some kind of uh, information education about the risks that just go along with being uh, in the indoor environment. And the more that we can inform and educate, the easier it will be to, uh, for us to practice you know, good, good cleaning practices. And you know, there's a huge research gap here. We know it's like, we, I feel like we're building a huge jigsaw puddle, puzzle, puddle, puzzle, 
you know, little bits and pieces are getting done and slowly they're connecting. But the vast majority of that puzzle, I would say, is really not finished yet. So I thank you for your attention and I would be very happy to uh, enter into dialogue with you and to answer your questions. Yeah, I have a question. Um, Dr. Scott, uh, one of the questions that uh, came to me when you were discussing uh, proper disinfectancy was um, obviously you need the proper chemistry to be able to do that. Um, by the way, uh, I am with an uh, uh, international uh, commercial cleaning outfit. We actually provide cleaning services. One of the things that we rely upon is information from the EPA and the EPA registration as well as the CDC. I wanted to get your take on something like a pathogen like C. diff where you have where you have the EPA providing registration for products claiming C. diff kills, and when you read further, you get into uh, uh, the definition of uh, it's only killing in the vegetative state. It doesn't deal with it on a, on a spore basis. And then you have the CDC saying, oh, we'll use bleach. So um, I just wondered if you had some comments about, you know, that, that it's very confusing for us in our in our business to, to look to a governmental agency like that for registration and then have what we consider somewhat misleading comments. I, I, I totally agree. I think it's a very, um, it is a very confusing field. It's not my area of expertise. I know there are other people in the audience who might want to jump in here. But um, there is this big gap between the sort of laboratory testing that's done that manufacturers have to achieve to get uh, EPA registration, for example, and then what's actually happening in the field. So, so much of the testing is done on a very small surface, a test tube, or then a very small surface in a laboratory. And how do you relate that to real life? And actually, the, the paper I want to give about mopping touches on that theme as well tomorrow. And I actually was in conversation last week with another group of, of experts in Boston who were talking about this very problem where you have products that are, make claims for C. diff, but only in the vegetative state. And what you're concerned about in, that, in those long-term care facilities is spores on the floors. Is there anyone else who wants to just jump in on that particular question? Well, why don't we save that for the panel? I'm, I'm Fine. Sure. We'll, we'll come back to that for the panel. OK. Uh, sorry, can I just add one other thing? The other, the other thing that's very confusing is the time, the kill requirements. You know, you know, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, whatever, you know. And again, is that, the, is that something that's realistic? That's carried out in the laboratory setting. Is that a realistic recommendation for an in-use setting that, that, that people would wait that length of time? Yes, my name is Lance Wilson. I'm the safety officer for uh, Portland Rehabilitation Center for Portland, Oregon. Uh, the question I have is, you know, almost similar along the lines of the last gentleman, the adequacy of the information which is made available to us end users who, uh, who have to go and clean the environments which have been contaminated. Uh, in the last few months, I had to deal on one hand a uh, vetromycin resistant enterococcus, which was a new term for me. I didn't even know how to pronounce it until a few months ago. And on the other hand, I also had to deal with a norovirus. And yet, I go to the CDC website, and it tells me chlorine is the most, you know, effective method in order to clean. Yet, I go to a conference, and it tells me, well, here is a norovirus, and it lives happily in a, in a solution of chlorine up to 10 parts per million. So it doesn't sound like to me the information is adequate. And what is the best way we could be able to go find up-to-date adequate information in order to be able to adequately address, you know, the cleanup, the remediation needs of these facilities? Again, um, I could only reiterate that I, I agree there's this huge gap in, in what's being recommended, you know, at CDC or other agency levels, and then what's, you know, what we're hearing in the science and what's happening in reality. So for norovirus, um, it's very long living in the environment. It seems to be very resistant as it sits around in our environment. And um, you're talking about chlorine bleach, but you know, how do you, what do you, what do you do when you have norovirus in the carpets and on the, in the upholstery, which is frequently the problem because of the projectile vomiting situation, the virus falls out and uh, lands onto the environment. So how do you deal with that, even if you are using chlorine bleach? 
you don't use that. So now you're using hot water extraction kind of processes then. Again, anyone else want to? Well, let me, let me suggest this. I'd like to suggest, because we really need to break now for lunch. Let me, well, let's me let make that another, the first question for our panel discussion this afternoon, because we'll have all our scientists up in front. And I would like to spend some time on this. I didn't want to just take a minute or two while. Okay. Yeah, I've got one comment. Uh, Liz, this is one of the best presentations I have seen in cleaning science ever, the best. I think the presentation you just heard is probably one of the most important things that's going to come out of this conference. I spent uh, many years in EPA. I was part of the risk assessment guideline team that, that developed risk assessments. Your risk as analysis framework and your risk management structure based on that framework is the key to what cleaning is all about. You did a qualified risk analysis here for the very first time on the killers, not on, on low-risk chemicals in the environment, but the killers. The research that needs to be done further is to take this from a qualitative research analysis to a quantitative research analysis. Then you will get the full attention of national decision makers in what you try to do. While this is fresh, I just want you to, to look again at this framework and keep this particular talk in mind. That's, that's how important this talk is. 